Welcome to another video from Creative Learning Resources. This video is an edited recording of a live lesson with one of my students. As a respect to the privacy and identity rights of my student, I have removed all conversations and discussions with my student during the online lesson. So today's topic is air and water, in which we are going to see the composition of air and different aspects of water. First thing first, we are going to see different tests, which we need to know for the presence of water. The first test which we are going to learn about is the use of anhydrous copper sulfate. The word anhydrous means it does not contain any water and means non, it's non-hydrous. The word hydra means water. This is anhydrous copper sulfate, which is white in color, or we can say anhydrous copper 2 sulfate as it is a transition element so we should write down 2 after putting the name of the metal copper whenever we are writing down any transition element we should write down the oxidation state of that metal so the oxidation state of copper in copper sulfate molecule is 2 and the color of the anhydrous copper sulfate is white when the white colored powdery substance comes in contact with water it is going to absorb the water water will be held between the crystals of copper 2 sulfate and it will turn into blue colored hydrated copper 2 sulfate which is crystalline. This property of copper 2 sulfate can be used to detect the presence of water. Now we're going to see the chemical reaction of anhydrous copper 2 sulfate in which CuSO4 combines with H2O. It is not a chemical reaction. Water molecules are just held between the crystals of the copper sulfate and remember that there are five crystals held in the crystal lattice of CuSO4 with each molecule. This can be seen in this video as well in which hydrated copper 2 sulfate crystals which are blue in color are heated and then they are changing the color from blue to white because the water held between the crystals is actually coming out. This could be seen by the condensation occurring at the walls of the test tube. And when these white colored anhydrous copper 2 sulfate crystals are coming in contact with water again, the water again transforms this powdered white anhydrous copper 2 sulfate into crystalline form. And after holding the water of crystallization, it starts giving a blue color. This property could be used to detect whether the water is present somewhere or not. The second test which we need to know according to the syllabus is the use of cobalt chloride. Anhydrous cobalt chloride is blue in color, unlike the copper sulfate, in which copper sulfate is blue once it is hydrated. But once this cobalt chloride absorbs water, its color changes to pink. This cobalt chloride could also be used extensively in biological experiments in which the strips of paper which are soaked in cobalt chloride are placed on the top or at the bottom of the leaf, which surface loses more water, upper or lower, and the cobalt chloride paper could be used by soaking the strips of paper in cobalt chloride solution and then drying it out. Then cobalt chloride paper strip is placed on the leaf on its upper surface as well as on its lower surface. So this cobalt chloride paper could then be turning into pink and this color change is indicating the presence of water. The lower surface loses more water because of the presence of stomatal openings, which lose a lot of water during the process called as transpiration. So in this video, we can also watch that the two strips are attached at the upper as well as lower surface of the leaf and eventually covered by transparent glass slides and left for a few hours. And then it can be seen very easily that the lower surface has started turning pink much more rapidly as compared to the strip attached to the upper surface. So the anhydrous cobalt chloride once absorbs water, its color changes into pink hydrated cobalt chloride. So the change of the blue color of the cobalt chloride is indicating the presence of water. This is a very useful test and very practical, which has unlimited practical applications. Second part is describe and outline the treatment of the water supply in terms of filtration and chlorination. How can we treat the water to make it uh, drinkable or to make it clean? Basically, in the syllabus, you don't have to talk about how can you convert water into the drinkable form. It means that we are going to talk about all that water which is coming out after the domestic use. It means that the water coming out from houses, like, you know, once we are using the water and after that use that water is going out and then it it has to be treated so this mm. water has to go for 
the treatment. So this is mm. the sewage. We are, basically, we are talking about sewage treatment. And this is the domestic waste. This might be coming out from industry as well. So it could be the industrial waste as well. We are going to get this water and definitely the water coming out from the industry that is containing much more chemicals and maybe like you know a lot of pollutants so if all that water is thrown inside some water reserve or some water body this is going to cause a severe damage to the aquatic life mm. so before throwing that water into any water reserve any nearby water reserve this water has to be treated and mm. in that particular treatment first of all like in this water it has to be passed through filtration process so for that purpose we have the filters these filters sometimes they are sand filters so this water is going and then this water is sent it is going to pass through a container which is having sand inside the sand particles they are pretty big and these sand particles act like a filter and they are going to they're going to basically filter out the large particles so they are all stuck inside the sand. So then the water, once it comes out from the opposite side, this is now filtered. So this tank is called as filtration tank. That is the process of filtration, which took place over here at the first stage. And sometimes it's not just one step of filtration. In the first step, we let the water pass through coarse filter elements, like, you know, the particles are really big and they are separated over there. Then we pass through this with the more fine filters. Let's say install a pump. This is going up and then we are adding this water again. This is passing through a more fine filter. That filter is going to separate the larger particles. We have a fine filter in our second tank. So second Second tank is containing comparatively a fine filter, or you can say it is the second filter and then water is passing through another pump and the other pump with the pressure sometimes there's aeration or sometimes we add chlorine aeration mean like you know the air is added and sometimes the chlorine is added that process is called as chlorination the chlorine basically is an antiseptic it means that it is going to kill all the bacteria present in the water or any other microorganisms so chlorination mm -hmm. is going to help us to kill any microbes so it kills microorganisms. Microorganisms got killed. And mm -hmm. now we're going to talk about air. It is E11.2. That is about air. And first of all, like, you know, we need to know the composition of clean air. So it means yeah. that, like, you know, we're going to talk about, like, uh, air composition and uh, the major gases which are present in air. Major constituent of air is nitrogen. So we need to know that uh, which particular gas we're talking about the component is nitrogen which is 78 percent how much oxygen do we have 21 percent and then we have the other things like noble gases which are very very small the quantity is really tiny we have water vapors we have carbon dioxide as well which is 0.04 percent and we have the noble gases and most of them are gone now let's talk about water vapors so water vapors they are we can say less than one percent some of the noble gases major mm. composition of the noble gas all these are called as trace elements the elements which are present in a very very small amount so in the mm. noble gases mostly it is argon it is also less than one percent so that is the basic composition that you need to know you don't need to know the percentage of uh, argon and all that stuff it keeps on changing it's not exactly fixed i'm not going to talk about the major pollutants major pollutants present in the air basically they could be many pollutants but according to the syllabus we need to know about three pollutants and these three pollutants include the carbon monoxide and mm -hmm. we have the sulfur dioxide and then we have oxides of nitrogen there are many types of uh, nitrogen oxides it can be no nitrogen monoxide or monoxide one ox oxygen dinitro oxide and and nitrogen dioxide these are different types of oxides of nitrogen which can be present and then we have the carbon monoxide monomine one there's only one oxygen the carbon monoxide is actually a very very harmful pollutant and it can bind permanently with the hemoglobin is going to decrease the oxygen carrying capacity of blood basically decreases oxygen transport ability of the blood. The 
then we have sulfur dioxide. What is a greenhouse effect that we're going to see right now? Let's say this is our planet Earth. And now this green circle is indicating our atmosphere. So basically what happens that the high energy radiations coming from sun, these high energy radiations hit the Earth's surface. And then many of them, like, you know, or you can say most of them, not all, reflect from the surface and they go back and they're going back into space. What does a greenhouse gas do? A greenhouse gas is actually blocking these high energy radiations and preventing them to go back into space. So a greenhouse gas blocks the passage. It is stopping high energy radiations to go back into the space. Like it is not like, you know, all, not all of them are going back into the space as we have already mentioned that. So some of the energy is absorbed or it is trapped inside the earth. Like some of the energy is taken up by the earth. Some of the energy is staying inside the atmosphere, but a greenhouse gas stop the high energy ultraviolet radiations to go back to space so because the greenhouse gases are not letting the high energy radiations to go back to space temperature of the earth keeps on rising so an increase mm -hmm. in the temperature of earth is the effect of all of these greenhouse gases increasing in the atmosphere so increase in the earth's temperature is the outcome of the increase in greenhouse gases these greenhouse gases include carbon dioxide, methane, CH4, and water vapors as well. Water vapors also play a very important role as a greenhouse gas. And the oxides of nitrogen, NO, mm -hmm. N2O, and then we have NO2. All these mm -hmm. oxides of nitrogen, they are playing a very important role as greenhouse gas. So this is called as a greenhouse effect. And why is it called greenhouse effect? Because uh, like, you know, the greenhouse is uh, the building in which like uh, sometimes it's a huge building in which plants are grown and a greenhouse is having its uh, ceiling or its walls made up of glass. And this is, let's say, a greenhouse and this is having the glass ceiling, glass roof. And there is almost no ventilation over there. No air can escape. Air is trapped in. Similarly, the high energy radiations, they are coming to the greenhouse and then these high energy radiations coming from sun they are trapped in and this is good for the plants because then we don't have to put extra money for artificial heating or we have to turn on the electrical heaters or gas heaters so the plants they start growing and they're growing over there pretty well because this is going to help to maintain the temperature as it is a similar effect on earth that's why it is called as greenhouse effect and these gases are called as greenhouse gases that's why the effect is similar or identical to the effect which we have seen in the greenhouses so that's why the name is given as a greenhouse effect now that we can understand that the things which we have talked about, the pollutants in the air, we have said that we have three pollutants and these three pollutants, they include carbon monoxide. We already have discussed what is the adverse effect of that on health. Sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide is actually a gas which is released due to combusting or burning of sulfur containing fossil fuel. So any fossil fuel which is containing sulfur, that is going to add sulfur dioxide. How can we prevent that from happening? Before using the fossil fuel, if we remove the sulfur from the fossil fuel. So that is mm -hmm. one way by which we can prevent ourselves to uh, get exposed to too much of the sulfur dioxide. Remove sulfur from fossil fuel before combustion before burning it combustion mm -hmm. means burning so before burning mm -hmm. if we remove the sulfur present in the fossil fuel that's going to help us to reduce the sulfur dioxide emissions into the air and what is the effect of sulfur dioxide the sulfur dioxide is basically causes acid rain this sulfur dioxide it combines with water water present in clouds or water present or with the rain water and it can form sulfurous acid which is H2SO3, and then it can make sulfuric acid, which is H2SO4. And as you can see that both of these are acids. So what will be the effect of these acids? They're going to cause 
acid drain. Effect is the acid drain plus all this acid is going to come down along with the rain and mm. this is going to destroy crops. This acid drain, it can destroy crop, all the crops in the crop fields. If there's a lot of acid coming with the rain, that's going to destroy, that's going to damage the leaves of the crops. It is going to destroy buildings. Uh, many of the buildings, they use marble, which is mm. uh, calcium carbonate. And the calcium carbonate reacts with the acid. This calcium carbonate reacting with the sulfuric acid, H2SO4. We get calcium sulfate, CSO4, plus we get H2O, plus we get CO2. Calcium carbonate, which is the building marble, gets destroyed. Many of the, like, you know, many very expensive buildings, historical buildings, even commonly like marble is used for decorative purposes on the building. So that marble gets destroyed. Plus the acid is going to affect the aquatic life as well because the acid reaching into any like you know water reserve if it is becoming too acidic a lot of acid is coming along with the rainwater all the aquatic animals present in like you know any pond or in any lake or even mm -hmm. in the river and in the ocean they're going to get destroyed because too much of the acid their bodies are not designed to withstand and they don't have mm -hmm. this ability to withstand like you know a very high acid tolerance sometimes like some animals they have a higher acid tolerance they can survive but normally like you know generally the fish over there they are going to die because of less acid tolerance all of the aquatic life that's going to get destroyed or that's going to get affected because according to our research the ability for the fish to lay eggs is going to decrease because of too much acid in the water yeah this acid can also cause a disease called as cataract a cataract is a disease of eye in which the cornea which is the top or so the front most transparent layer it becomes mm -hmm. opaque so if the cornea will become opaque the person who is suffering with this disease he or she is going to have blurred vision it can eventually lead to if they're not being properly treated from one eye or both eyes could be lost. Going back to the previous board, we have discussed mm. the effects of sulfur dioxide, which is going to cause acid rain. Then we have the oxides of nitrogen and the oxides of nitrogen is as sulfur dioxide, the oxides of nitrogen, it could be NO or N2O or NO2. These are the oxides of nitrogen, very, very harmful because oxides of nitrogen can also cause acid rain. So we're going to talk about the oxide of nitrogen, NO, N2, O or NO2 can combine with water to make nitric acid. So all of the effects which we have talked about on the previous board over here, like the building marble, it gets affected once it is reacting with the sulfuric acid produced as a result of sulfur dioxide. Same will be the effect from the nitric acid as well. But of course, nitric acid is comparatively a weaker acid as compared to sulfuric acid. It doesn't have the same intensity of effect or same mm. level or degree of effect as the sulfuric acid has. But of course, as it is an acid, so similarly as the sulfuric acid is going to have an effect on the aquatic life nitric acid has the same effect it doesn't cause cataract like you know it doesn't contribute into that but there is another effect by nitrogen dioxide the nitrogen dioxide other than it can make an acid nitrogen dioxide is also a ghg it means that it's a greenhouse effect so it can also cause global warming as we have talked about on this board over here so the Oxides of nitrogen, NO, N2O, and NO2, they can cause global warming. So the global warming is also one of the effects of increased nitrogen oxide, oxide of nitrogen into the air. Remember this thing, this is a very common mistake students usually do. They think that the sulfur dioxide is also a GHG. Remember this thing, sulfur dioxide is not a greenhouse gas. It does not contribute into global warming. It's not a greenhouse gas. It doesn't cause any greenhouse effect. So the effect of sulfur dioxide is just like, you know, it can cause acid rain, it can destroy aquatic life. It can destroy buildings because it is reacting with the marble. It can react with the metallic structures like bridges and all that stuff. So mm -hmm. a lot of construction material like the bridges, which are made up of metals, they can get affected. We have talked about nitrogen monoxide, 
oxygen dioxide and all that stuff so oxide of nitrogen greenhouse gases and how are they produced they are produced by burning fuel inside the internal combustion engine the engine that we have in our cars temperature inside those engines is very high so at a very high temperature inside engine the nitrogen can combine with oxygen these two gases have sufficient activation energy to react with each other rather these two gases they are present in air 78% nitrogen and it contains 21% oxygen but normally in the air they don't react and they don't make oxides of nitrogen but inside the engine as there is a very very high temperature that provides the energy of activation due to very high energy of activation we get or we make the oxides of nitrogen these oxides of nitrogen they should not be just thrown out straight away they should pass through a catalytic converter so all the exhaust gases coming out from a car they should pass through a catalytic converter we are seeing that these are the gases coming from the car's engine then we have a catalytic converter over here and this catalytic converter going to convert or catalyze the chemical reaction as a result of the catalytic converter it actually separates the oxygen from nitrogen and separating it and making n2 and o2 so separation of nitrogen and oxygen that is the job of the catalytic converter and then these two gases thrown out from the exhaust pipe into the air and you know that the nitrogen is a harmless gas it is non reactive gas or inert gas and oxygen is a good thing oxygen is a good gas we use it for our respiration process next lesson we're going to finish this topic please don't forget to subscribe the channel press the bell icon for the latest updates and drop a comment or any questions in the comment section below thanks a ton for watching hope to see you again soon